Hello, and welcome back to Our Moment, the literary podcast. It's me again, your host, Exquisite. The last time we spoke, I gave an introduction to the book Legendborn. I described the author, Tracy Dion, and we went a little bit through the prologue. Well, today, I want us to talk about three and a half of the main characters that we meet in part one. I'm attempting to keep our podcast as spoiler-free as possible up until episode four. I want it to be so that anybody who stumbles upon this podcast won't be too spoiled if they listen to the first episode and then like let's see the second episode and then hopefully by the third episode they actually decide that they want to buy the book because then they don't have to worry too much about spoilers and for context I will always give a spoiler warning if I intend to get into any spoilery territories um so yes hi welcome back so today we're going to talk about our main character, Brianna Matthews, known as Brie. We're also going to talk about Selwyn Kane, and we're also going to talk about Nick Davis. I have to start this out by saying I am a little bit silly, I'm a little bit goofy, and I've already read the book, and each time I read the book, whenever I meet Nick and Selwyn again, I start giggling. I can't help it. For those of you who are going to read the book, and if you're listening to this, I sure do hope that at some point you decide to read this book. Um, I just have to say, like, Nick is the love of my life. <laughs> we'll get into why later, but I will say when he pops up in the book, I did draw hearts around his name. And I did say, that's my man. That's my bestie. And when Selwyn pops up, I also giggled and I did I did like get a little bit embarrassing. I'm not too grown to admit where I get embarrassed, (laughs) where I do something that can be considered embarrassing. But the other character we're going to speak about is after Brie. And a little later on in the podcast, I'll break her down. But first, let's talk about our main girl, Brie Matthews. And in order to talk about her... I want to go to a page in the book where we are explicitly given what she looks like. This is, um, once again, a little bit of spoilers, but it basically just tells us what she looks like. So, in Bree's head, she is 5'8", tall enough that she might pass for a college student, and she's black. She's blessed with her mother's cheekbones and curves and her father's full mouth. She wears an old tee and jeans. And she's not really shy. That's one thing to know about Brianna. Brianna, she doesn't like to go by her full name. She goes by Brie. Or in the case of her best friend who calls her Maddie. And Maddie is a play on her last name, Matthews. But she goes by Brie. And not only is she tall, not only is she black, but she's also very imposing. She stands up. And when she says she's not shy, she means that. Brie is a very pushy person. She's self-described as pushy. She's self-described as stubborn. And throughout the entirety of the novel, we get this, but especially in part one, without going too far into spoiler details and without breaking down part one in its entirety, I'm going to do that in episode four of our moment podcast. We'll go into a beat by beat breakdown of what goes down in part one. Um, But without doing any of that in this episode, it's important for you guys to know that Miss Bree will always attempt to get her way, whether that is detrimental to her cause or not. There are some cases where it's almost like maybe if she was a little quieter, it could have gone better. But Bree is not in the in the interest of shrinking herself down. And I love that about her. I also love that she is black. And I also love that it is described, her natural hair is like reverently described in this. And she enjoys having it. At one point in the beginning, another character 
points out her natural hair and he's like, oh, that's cool or whatever. And she's like, what are you trying to say? <laughs> because as you know, she's on this campus surrounded by white people and they're talking about her hair. And she's just like, let me make sure they got one thing straight, you know, like this is me and she's proud of it. And she, she wears her hair up in a bun. Another thing about Brie that we come to realize is that the death of her mother has taken a toll on her. Uh, the half character that I'm going to talk about after I break down Cell and Nick is named After Brie. And After Brie is a little bit of an enigma. Let's just say that. She's a little bit of an enigma. But, um, yeah, Brie is... Brie is strong, she's she's hard-headed, but she's also a huge nerd. Her best friend's name is Alice. Alice is Asian, and they both got into the UNC Chapel Hill program, so they're they're both 16. Um and they're like crazy smart. Brie is constantly quoting Jane Austen or Star Wars. She names drops Percy Jackson and she's she's just insanely intelligent and that's part of the reason that she got into this but another part of Brie is that she can be considered a little bit of a slacker because like she can get by on doing things she knows for a fact that she'll get an A on anything even if she doesn't have to study for me I was kind of the same way in high school I did put in a lot of work a lot of the time and honestly there were times where I probably cared a little bit too much about school <laughs> um as I was wont to do I was a teacher pet I was a suck up Brie is not a suck up but she just is naturally good at everything and in in the case of like being naturally good like what is what's up with her like she's so great at everything are we like do how does this serve our narrative well, in this story, this is obviously a very chosen one story, and I do love that trope. I think that trope works very well in certain instances, especially in this story. Um, and we have our Black chosen one. And in the case of a lesser author, um, one not as skilled as Miss Dion, we could end up in the territory of the magical black person, especially because as far as we know of part one, Brianna is our only black character right now. She's the only black person we see around this place. So it's like, yo, are we going into magical Negro territory? And never at any point, and especially in the future of this novel, do we get magical Negro. Brianna is black because she is black and because we are getting a black heroine not because she needs to serve some white main character who would typically be a man but on our white main characters who are men let's talk about Selwyn Kane let me tell you when we are introduced to Selwyn it's automatically oh we're in bad boy like area the very first sentence we get about him is that he is a tall, dark-haired boy who is wearing black combo combat boots, and he has a very lazy expression on his face that's filled with disdain. And then Bree tells us that he is unsettlingly beautiful. His face is aristocratic and sharp and is framed by high, pale cheekbones. The rest of his body is born from shadows, black jacket, black pants, ink black hair that falls over his forehead and it's just a little bit uh, curly. He has gauged, gauges in his ears and he's about 18. But another point that she points out is that he's very still and his very gaze, like she feels his gaze on her skin. It shocks her. And she's, I wouldn't say she's attracted to him. She's kind of scared of him. And for good reason. Because Cell is a Merlin. Now, 
I bring this up because Merlin's are in part one, and we're going we're going into a little bit of a spoilery territory here, but not much. Merlins are, as far as we know, they are magic casters, and they are monster hunters, as far as we know, as of part one. And Cell automatically does not trust Brianna. He doesn't like her, and he's not very kind to her. He's kind of this intriguing feature, right? Um, and all we know is that he's very powerful, and he's powerful enough to tempt well, not I wouldn't say tempt the police. He's powerful enough to scare the police, to kind of, like, put them in their place, in a sense. Like, the police are reverent of him. They, like, they, like, they, like, fold to him or whatever. And it's also important to know that Cell has these golden eyes. And I, I, I didn't mention the golden eyes at first because it's in, they're important. Like, let's stick a pin in that. They're going to come back. They're going to come back later on in the book. They're going to come back in future episodes. They're going to come back. And so they're very important. So I want you guys to, like, remember them. Um, Cell carries himself with a lot of, like, energy, well-maintained, like, constrained power. And let me just say, he's one of my favorites. However, he becomes my favorite later on in the book. If you were to ask me when I first started reading what I thought about Cell, I would tell you I could not stand this man. I thought he was terrible. But he gets some much needed character development. And because this is attempting to be a spoiler free episode, I'm not going to talk too much about his character development and what we know of him. All you need to know is that he's dark and mysterious and he has magical abilities. <laughs> Now, on to Cell's almost direct opposite, Nicholas. <laughs> and I don't know if you can hear it in my voice, but I love Nick. I love him. He's really, he's really my, like, one of my favorite people. And he's one of my favorite people from the jump, right? He's one of my, like, it's one of those things where you just know. I think <laughs> I mentioned earlier that I drew hearts around his name when he pops up. Well, I forgot to say that I also like kind of lost my mind just a little bit. And I just wrote, I was like, he's my golden boy. He's adorable. And let, let me let me get into why I say this. When we first meet Nick, we meet him through a text and he texts Bree and he says, hi, Brianna, this is Nick Davis. Um, because he is now her mentor because Brie gets into a little bit of trouble that I'll break down further in a few episodes um he she gets in a little bit of trouble and now she's assigned this like peer mentor who's done everything before who's done this before um I don't know if you just heard a beeping but that beeping that you heard if you heard it is part of my love of Nick <laughs> that's what that means um but we're going to, like, talk about what Nick looks like. And when we first meet him, Nick calls out Brianna's government name. And Brie, as we know of her, our, like, fiery, redheaded girl. Redheaded. She's not redheaded. She has red magic as, like, evident by the cover. But she's definitely not a redhead. Um, but he hunts her down. And he calls her out. He says, Brianna Irene Matthews. And she's like, who in the world is calling my government name in a public area? That's not what you're trying to do. Are you trying to get fought? Like, she's really, like, going to fight this dude. Um, and then she meets him. And when she's, this is how he is described in the book. Leaning against the wall, just beside the exit, is a tall white boy with tousled straw blonde hair and the bluest eyes I've ever seen. He looks like he belongs on the cover of the university brochure, impossibly bright and cheery, wearing plain jeans and a Carolina blue zipped hoodie. When he laughs, the sound is warm and genuine. And then she promptly calls him her babysitter because she wants nothing to do with him. And Nick is very, he's very good humored. But we also know that Nick is fighting his own legacy, right? He doesn't want 
to conform to what his father wants. And Bree doesn't really like that because, as I mentioned before, and I keep bringing it up because also Tracy Dion keeps bringing it up in the novel. Bree has lost her mother and she doesn't understand why Nick would continue to like try and go against his father. She says about Nick, she says Nick appears like he should be like playing football and all that stuff. And instead, Nick plays like cricket, which he says is like the dumbest game he could think about. But also on our fair Nicholas, we understand soon enough that he has pretty high up in this secret society called the Order. The Order is a secret society on the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill's campus that takes after the Knights of the Round Table. And once again, if you can tell, I'm just struggling a little bit here because I just want to talk so much about certain things, but I'm holding back because I don't want us to, I don't want to spoil the book. I don't want us to like, to get too deep into spoiler territory. But all you need to know is that Nick is basically, he is family founded the secret society. Like generations and generations and generations ago, his family founded said secret society. And that's an important thing to happen. And Nick clashes with Bree. Not in the same way that Selwyn clashes with Bree. Selwyn scares Bree or at least intimidates her. Nick makes Bree want to fight. Like, she wants to fight him. Like, um, in the sense that they go back and forth. She's pushy. Bree is smarter than Nick in certain situations. Like, they meet up in a biology class. And they have a discussion about DNA. And Brie kind of, she has to tell him, like, what RNA does. She has to tell him all that. And Nick is, like, admired by that. And he's also, he also admires her tenacity into getting what she wants. And speaking of getting what she wants, now we are going to talk about after Brie. After Brie is described as the unwanted souvenir that death gave Brianna. After Brie is Brianna that appeared after her mother's death. Brie, our main character, kind of describes herself as two different people. She says the girl that she was before her mom died is not the same as the girl she is now. And so after Brie is what came about from that. So she says, after Brie was with me when the visiting mourners finally went home. After Brie came into being the day after my mom died. Even though I can only recall hazy snippets from the hospital, trauma-related memory loss, according to my father's weird preachy grief book, I have after Brie. In my mind's eye, after Brie almost looks like me. She's tall, athletic, warm brown skin, broader than I want shoulders. But where my dark tight curls are usually pulled up on top of my head, after breeze stretch wide and loose like a live oak tree. Where my eyes are brown, hers are the dark ochre, crimson and obsidian of molten iron in a furnace. Because after Brie is in a constant state of near explosion. It's the worst at night when she presses against my skin from the inside and the pain is unbearable. She lives and breathes inside my chest, one heartbeat behind my own, life and breath like an angry echo. Alice doesn't know about after Bree. Nobody does. Not even my dad. Especially not my dad. So what we know about after Bree is that she is almost the embodiment of Brianna's anger and her grief surrounding the death of her mother. But she's also this new person that Brie doesn't even want to touch. She doesn't want to acknowledge the fact that there's something in her that is just so angry all the time and so furious, especially with herself, because she blames herself for her mother's death. And we have to know that after Brie is impulsive. When I said we're going to talk about three and a half characters, the half character is after Brie, because while she's Brianna, she's also her own person. Um, after Brie has wild hair and after Brie is our Brianna's defense mechanism. 
at some point when Brianna is confronted by her professor and her dean, she says, sometimes I wish I could shrink into someone more convenient. Um, and I think that's an experience that a lot of Black people, especially Black women, have where we feel like we're taking up too much space or we are being an inconvenience to those around us and we want to be able to like make ourselves smaller, make ourselves fit into this box, especially when we're in an area where we're surrounded by people who don't look like us or people who don't understand us. And after Brie is like the antithesis of convenience. She's angry. Her hair is big and wild and unfurling. She's got angry eyes. She wants to talk back. She wants to run at any obstacle that comes before Brianna. And Brie doesn't really like that. She wants to keep after Brie tucked away. She doesn't want to talk about that anger. She doesn't want to talk about that grief. And at some points throughout this novel, even when Dion doesn't explicitly tell us we're dealing with after Brie, you can notice in some moments, oh, well, that was after Brie who was pushing back against Nick. That was after Brie who ran recklessly. And I want to caution against thinking of after Brie as irrational and simply angry. Because when we're dealing with grief, is it not rational to want to act out? Is it not rational to think against the norms of what's going on? Is it not rational to be stuck? So even though it seems irrational to us, like, why are you rushing out? Why aren't you telling your dad about this person that you conceived? Why aren't you doing any of that? It's not, it's not like, it's not too rational. Now, before we close, I think there's only, there's one other person I just want to slightly bring up, and it's Brianna's dad. And while he's not a main character, he's this important aspect, because he's also the other person who is grieving Bree's mom like she is. He's the only other person in the world who knows what she's feeling, because he also lost the same person. But... His connection to her was different. While he is grieving a partner, a friend, a wife, Brie is grieving a mother. And so their grief takes on two different, uh, ex- they, they take on two different, like, expressions. Now, it's important to note that her dad is trying to be there for her. And I think that's very interesting because in a lot of books, especially books where we have a black main character, Sometimes it's like their parents aren't really present. And while her dad isn't on campus with her, he's there in text. He checks in on her. And he allowed her to leave because he knew it was what was best. It's what she needed to do in order to handle her grief, in a sense. And I just want you guys to think about, like, what does it say that she has an active, present father who is attempting to do what's best for his daughter? What does it say that Brie has the other figment of her imagination, which I don't think is a good word. She has this other um, expression of herself. What does it say that Brie now has these two men who could possibly love interests, who could po- we could possibly have a love triangle on her hands? What does it say about how she responds to them? What do, you, what do you think is going to happen in the rest of the story? How do you think that Brie is going to change? How do you think after Brie is going to change? How do we think that dark, cool, collected Selwyn, who scares us and who's, who much of the audience, and me included when I first read this, may dislike in this first part, how do we think he's going to grow? How do we think Nicholas is going to grow? We know that he's supposed to be like this descendant of greatness at least in the far as we know that they established the secret society on campus um and how do we think that their character arcs are going to change how do we think Bree's like interactions with other people are going to change yeah um i really hope you enjoyed this episode of our moment 
Thank you for tuning in for a second time. I'm glad you got a little further. I hope it was a little more entertaining. Um, I hope you don't judge me too harshly for talking about how much I love Nick and Cell and like giggling whenever they pop up on screen. They just make me that happy, guys. I'm sorry. Like, I'm sorry. I can't make the characters not bop. And I understand you guys don't get it. You don't get it right now. But those are the loves of my life. That's my man. I'm going to stick beside him. Um, that's my men. What do you guys think about love triangles? Um, if you're listening to this on YouTube, leave a comment on love triangles. And if there are any of your favorite love triangles, or if you think they're kind of stupid, or if you don't want to agree with them. And if you're listening on Spotify, um, you can follow me on Twitter and leave a comment there. You can also follow me on Goodreads at Exquisite Williams. I'm on Instagram also as at, at Exquisite Williams. And I'm on Twitter at, at Exquisite W-I-L because Twitter thinks my name is too long. Thank you for enjoying this episode. I hope I kept it as explore, spoiler free as possible. And I can't wait to talk to you next time. In our next episode, we are going to talk a little bit about the themes of grief. We're going to actually dive into the meat of the magic in this book. And it's going to be a fun time. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you next Sunday. Back here, same time, same place. See you later. Bye.